Let's uh, start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our lesson. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us all here safely. Uh, thank you, Edwin, for covering for me last week. Um, so if you re remember back two weeks ago, we didn't really finish, or at least in my mind, finish chapter two. Um, there's more I think we should say about it. Um, what we're going to do is uh, chapter two connects a lot with chapter seven. And so when we come to chapter seven, it will have been away from chapter two for a few weeks anyway. Uh, so I think it will make the most sense for us to kind of recap uh, chapter 2 as we make connections to chapter 7. Um, but I do just want to make sure we kind of have two takeaways from chapter 2 in our mind because they, they play a role throughout the rest of the book and they play a role tonight. Um, but through Daniel's prophecy in, in chapter 2, God's really establishing a timeline, a, a timeline for the nations of the world. As we know, this is all taking place so far during what empire? Babylonian, right, thank you. Um, so, so we're introduced to four different earthly kingdoms, kingdoms in that dream in chapter 2, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And we can look in history and see how those uh, empires succeed each other. Um, and, and through that, God is in making the point that he is the one behind the scenes controlling the rise and fall of nations uh, and so those nations, as powerful as they may be, are all going to fall and be destroyed. They're not going to be everlasting kingdoms. They're all going to fall. We, we know that from history. All right, we're going to see one of them fall in the ne next week in chapter 5. Um, and then the second, really the ultimate takeaway from chapter 2 is that in the days of that last kingdom, the Roman Empire, God's going to establish his everlasting kingdom that's going to be far different from these temporary earthly kingdoms. Um, God, so what I think essentially is happening there is, is Daniel is establishing this pro prophetic timeline and establishing the period in which the Messiah is going to come and God's going to establish his eternal kingdom. All right, so we've got the, 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 the control over the nations by God, and then we've got this everlasting kingdom, kind of the two big takeaways from chapter 2. All right, so you covered chapter 3 last week, a lot of powerful lessons from that. Uh, we see the importance of, of friendship. I think we read the, a very different story when we come to Daniel if we don't have these three friends together. They, they were isolated, but they were not totally alone. Daniel and his uh, friends had each other to rely on while everyone else was uh, caving in and compromising. Um, and so we see the powerful example that the stand that these three uh, men uh, at this point, uh, they're no longer teen, uh, teen, teenagers, I think, and we see the powerful example uh, that they make because the impression on Nebuchadnezzar is very strong. And so Nebuchadnezzar proclaims the power of God throughout his, his kingdom because of that. We see, of course, that God saves uh, there in chapter 3. So when we come to chapter 4, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, Daniel re-enters the picture. We don't read about him in chapter 3, and we don't really know why. There's some different reasons for that, um, but we don't know exactly why. But, but Daniel re-enters the picture in chapter 4, but as I think we'll see, he's really kind of just there as an interpreter, as, as a prophet, as a messenger of God, explaining to Nebuchadnezzar what is going on, because chapter 4 starts very similar to how chapter 2 starts. Nebuchadnezzar being disturbed by a dream that Daniel goes on to interpret. So, so the focus I think really we're going to see here is the relationship, interestingly, between Nebuchadnezzar and God. So let's think about what, what Nebuchadnezzar has learned thus far about God. So he, he learns, first of all, that there's something different 
about the people of God. There's something different about the people of God. He learns that in chapter 1 when he sees these four young men, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. There's something different about them. As they go through this program, they're 10 times better than the other men going through the program. And so they're elevated to a position of prominence. There's something different about the people of God. Nebuchadnezzar sees that again and again in the lives of these young men. Uh, chapter 2, he sees that God is a revealer of secrets. All right, what, what did he try, what, who did he go to first in chapter 2? All his, his sorcerers, his magicians, things like that, and they're unable to tell him the meaning of his dream. They're unable to reveal the secret of his dream. Who ultimately is? It, it's Daniel, but not really Daniel, it's God, and Daniel's just the interpreter. So God is a revealer of secrets, uh, and Nebuchadnezzar realizes that, that distinction between Jehovah and between his gods. He also recognized there in chapter 2 that God, Jehovah, is different from these other gods. He doesn't come away from chapter 2 a, a, a monotheistic believer in Jehovah. He may believe and see the power of Jehovah, but he still believes in his other gods, okay? But he does, I think, recognize that there's something different about Jehovah, He's a God of gods, a Lord of lords, as he says there in chapter 2. Chapter 3, as we just mentioned, he sees that God saves those who are faithful to him. So he's, he's not just discarded these people of Jerusalem, these people of Judah. He's still involved in their lives, and those who are faithful to him, he protects and watches over. And so Nebuchadnezzar, when we come to the end of chapter 3, he's reacting very strongly to this. I mean, he decrees... Uh, uh, makes a decree that no one can say anything wrong about Jehovah, and if they do, what, what is the punishment? What's that? Yeah, but it says that they'll be torn limb from limb, which is interesting because that's the same thing he wants to do to his, his, uh, his magicians at the end. So for whatever reason, he's really fond of this dismemberment uh, punishment. All right, so that brings us to chapter uh, 4. So chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the peoples, nations, and populations of all languages who live in all the earth. May your peace be great. I am pleased to declare the signs and miracles that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his miracles. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now, just so you know, there are some people, scholars who suggest that this really should be tagged on to the end of chapter 3. It's as kind of a continuation of the decree that Nebuchadnezzar gives at the end of chapter 3, whereas there are some who believe, as, as your Bible, I'm sure, has in front of you, that this belongs in a separate chapter, in chapter 4, verse 1. Um, that's kind of where I would fall on that. I think it makes sense that this belongs in chapter 4, uh, because if we think about the end of chapter 3, what, what do we just say? The decree is if you, if you don't, if you say anything against God, if you don't do, if you violate this command, you'll be dismembered, you'll be killed. But then how does the decree in verse 1 of chapter 4 start? It says, it talks about peace, right? So there are kind of different tones there. And so what I think is happening is that Nebuchadnezzar is kind of starting his testimony of what happens to him in chapter 4 with this uh, decree this proclamation about God uh, here in chapter 4. So I think this is kind of bookending what happens, the events of chapter 4, and the beginning with the proclamation about the power of God. And then we're going to see another proclamation at the end of chapter 4. But either way, uh, whichever event it kind of fits more in line with, the point is, is that Nebuchadnezzar is proclaiming God throughout his empire. So one of the themes, if you recall back to week one, is that uh, of the book is that clearly God is working through Daniel, right? God is working through the faithful, all right? Uh, but God is also working through the unfaithful. We see here that throughout the most powerful nation in the world at the time, through the most powerful man in the world, what's being proclaimed? It's not the gods of Babylon. It's the one true God. And notice, uh, what did he say in this proclamation? God is in control of the nations, his dominions from generation to generation, 
and his kingdoms and everlasting kingdom. Those two takeaways, essentially, from chapter 2. So Nebuchadnezzar is starting to realize the things that God is trying to impress on him. Um, some people think that, you know, there's no way someone like Nebuchadnezzar would have said this if you read those first three verses. In, in fact, verse 3 actually is almost word for word the same thing that you read over in Psalm 145, verse 13. They think that there's no way a pagan god would have decreed something like this to his kingdom. Um, it had to have been a Jewish person that said that. And, and frankly, I think that's fine. I think it makes sense. I think we see the, the influence of Daniel in that it's possible that Daniel had a hand in drafting this proclamation. All right, so let's get into uh, verse 4 and the meat of what's going on in this chapter. Um, I'm not going to read through everything just for sake of time. I'm going to rely on you having read it or reading it later, uh, but we'll read some, some key parts here. Uh, but let's pick up in verse 4. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and happy in my palace. I saw a dream and it startled me, and these appearances as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon so that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the soothsayer priests, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and I related the dream to him. And then he goes on to relate the dream. So what are some similarities, if you, if you recall back to, to chapter 2, what are some similarities between what we read here and what Nebuchadnezzar uh, does compared to chapter 2? What are some similarities? Yeah, he calls the same losers. Okay. Uh, what's his reaction to the dream? I'm sorry? He's afraid. He's, afraid. He's clearly disturbed. Um, there's something that stands out about this dream to him, and as I, as we'll see, I think as we as he relates the dream to Daniel, I think he kind of knew a little bit about what the dream, what the implications of the dream were. Um, but clearly, this disturbs him. But what does it say about what's going on? What's what's his situation? What's his life like at the time this dream comes to him? Where was he? He's at his house. It says he's at he was at ease in my house and happy in my palace. All right, so I, I would say he's content, he's complacent. Um, in chapter two, we're told he was thinking about the future, you know, perhaps worrying, you know, the, the whole heavy lies, the, the heavy is the head that wears the crown type thing. But here he's he's happy where he's at. He's pleased with what he's accomplished. And so it's at that point that this dream comes in. He's content, he's complacent. Um, what kind of, uh, how, how do you think complacency, the attitude of being happy and at ease, how does that interact with our relationship with God? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I get the sense that Nebuchadnezzar thought that he had everything he needed. Um, he w could rest on his laurels. As we see, as we move on in, in verse 30, he's clearly attributing all of his success to who? Himself, right? Um, but I think complacency is, you know, we, you remember in Revelation, I forget which church it is, but what's, you remember a description about one of the churches that kind of indicated it was complacent? Well, that, but, but one of them is described as lukewarm, right? Not doing terrible, not, um, not on fire, but I kind of, when I think of complacency, I think of that. Uh, but wh if we're spiritually complacent, what, what are the risks of that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that, that was God's response to the church there. You think we're at risk? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, th I think if we, you know, Nebuchadnezzar is an unbeliever, but I, I think the, the idea of complacency and, and being caught up in your own life and the things that you've done, uh, we can have the same problem. I, I think the devil really has a way in when we're complacent, when we're at ease, when our guard is not up. I mean, you, you read over and over again in the New Testament uh, from Jesus to his apostles, from the apostles to the early church, the idea of being alert, being watchful, because Satan, he, he finds a way in when you're not on, the, on guard. Do you have a comment? Um, but, but I think that's when, when we're especially susceptible to Satan uh, in his tactics, when we're, when we're at ease, when we're comfortable, when we're not growing, not go, falling back, but we're just complacent. But it's at this point that Nebuchadnezzar uh, has this dream. And so he's maybe realizing God is powerful, but, but there's really no room in Nebuchadnezzar's life and heart uh, for God. He's got everything that he needs. So he's disturbed by the dream. He again calls the wise men to him. So this is interesting to me because as, as you know, somebody mentioned, these are the same losers that couldn't interpret the dream uh, in chapter 2. So, I mean, why do you think Nebuchadnezzar, he eventually goes to Daniel. Why would he not go to Daniel in the first place? Any, any thoughts, any ideas? If you're, uh, I mean, Daniel's chief, right? Um, if, if you're in any kind of business or organization, there are some things you don't always go straight to, to the top, right? That's why you have different layers of management, things like that. Um, you know, so there may have been a lot of things that he still used these men for. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and we don't really know how much time has passed between chapter 2, chapter 3. Um, I would say a, a fair amount of time has passed, but it, it seems like likely you're exactly right. When, when things go well, when something really stands out to him, he's enamored with God, but then he kind of goes back into his, his normal routine, his normal gods, uh, and, and Jehovah kind of just falls back in line with all of the other gods. Um, it, it could have just been Daniel is away. I mean, Daniel's an important person. He may have been away doing something else, and uh, he brought Daniel to him whenever Daniel got back into town. I, I don't know. Um, it, it could, some people suggest that on some level, Nebuchadnezzar knew that this had something to do with Jehovah and, and judgment, and so he kind of wanted to avoid Daniel at first. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. But in any case, we see the same story. The wise men are unable to interpret the dream because uh, they don't have God uh, on their side. So Daniel is called in. Uh, the other interesting thing, there's, there's one difference in what Nebuchadnezzar does here uh, from chapter 2. Anybody pick up on it? Yeah, this time he tells them the dream. Right? That was the big, the big deal in chapter 2, he wasn't going to tell anybody the dream because he didn't trust his wise men, right? Um, so for whatever reason, this time he does relay the dream. Um, maybe he's regained some trust in the wise men. Um, at, I, I think at this point, the wise men are probably far less likely to lie to Nebuchadnezzar because what's going to happen if they do? They're going to get torn from them to him because Daniel's going to come in and tell the truth and he's going to be able to do it. So they, they know they can't really get away with their their schemes as they might have before. Um, so there's not so much a need uh, to, to make that point as there was in chapter 2. All right, so we've got the dream. I won't read through all of this, uh, but he relates the dream uh, to him. So we have a, a great tree uh, that it grew large. It became strong uh, there in verse 11. Its height reached to the sky. Uh, it was in the middle of the earth. It was visible to all the earth. It was beautiful. It had abundant fruit. Uh, it gave shade to animals. 
Uh, birds could live in the branches. Um, so we have this great tree. Um, and the idea, imagery of a, a tree uh, is used to describe kings and kingdoms in various places uh, in, in the Bible. Ezekiel 31, uh, for example, uh, Assyria is described as a, as a great cedar that uh, has a great height, uh, and it is eventually cut down. We know Assyria was destroyed, right? Uh, but we see very similar language and imagery used to describe Assyria, of course, uh, as this dream in chapter 4, Daniel continues, we know this tree is going to get cut down as well. Um, Matthew 13, anybody remember a description of a, of a tree in a kingdom in uh, Matthew 13? The kingdom is like what? I think there's a fig tree at one point, but Matthew 13, there's, the kingdom's like a mustard seed. Matthew 13, 31, verse 32. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a person took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. So the kingdom of God starts very small, right, but becomes very big. And that kind of makes me think of chapter 2 of Daniel, all right, what was, what was representing the kingdom of God? A rock, a stone, all right, compared to these precious metals, something that's of less value, so smaller beginnings, but it becomes a, a kingdom that inhabits the whole earth, right? Um, so you kind of see a little bit of parallel there. So then back to Daniel 4, so we keep reading, uh, verse 13, I was looking in the visions in my mind, as I lay in my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher, a holy one, descended from heaven. He shouted out and spoke as follows, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, shake off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Yet leave the stump with its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it, and the new grass of the field, and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven, and let him share with the animals in the grass of the earth. Let his mind change from that of a human, and let an animal's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time come to pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. And he grants it to whomever he wishes, and sets it over the lowliest, of the, uh, the lowliest of people. All right, so we have this angelic watcher who says to chop up the tree, cut off the branches. Is the tree completely destroyed? No, what's left behind? All right, the stump and the roots, something that can grow after all this is said and done. Um, so we're talking about a tree, but then, then there's a, a, a kind of a change of, of, of phrasing. Uh, verse 16, let his mind change from that of a human. Uh, what, what does that indicate to you? We're talking about a group of people, a kingdom. We're talking about one, one person in particular, all right? And we're going to see that as this is interpreted. All right, so this, uh, this person, it, it, the point is so that this person is going to learn something. So let him be drenched with dew. He's going to eat grass. Uh, let his mind be replaced with an animal mind for seven periods. And this will take place so that the living will know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. So we already kind of see some of the explanation of the, the purpose of what's going to happen Nebuchadnezzar already sees some of this, all right? Nebuchadnezzar says as he's relating the dream to Daniel that this is in order so that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind. So that's why I think Nebuchadnezzar kind of realizes that this may involve the, the one true God, okay? Um, he already kind of knows that to some extent. So Daniel interprets the dream. Any questions about the, the dream itself? We can talk about the interpretation, but any questions, comments so far? 
All right, so verse 19. Daniel, then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar replied, my lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. So Daniel is appalled by the dream. Why do you think he might, may have been appalled by the dream? Not just Nebuchadnezzar that's disturbed by this. Daniel, as he receives the interpretation of God, as he sees the meaning of the dream, he's appalled, he's disturbed. Why would he feel that way? Yeah, it could just be, well, man, I've got to, I've got to, clearly uh, this is not good, um, and now I've got to share it with the king. What else? What are some other reasons he might have been appalled? I, I think you're right. Whatever Daniel has felt personally about Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel recognizes what God has been, the point God has been making that God has risen up Nebuchadnezzar. God is the one who put him in this position. Uh, and God is, is, you're right, he's working through Nebuchadnezzar. So I, I, I don't, we don't know how closely, you know, if they were together daily, how often they were really together. They had to have developed some kind of working relationship. Right, um, so I, I suspect that as time has gone on, Daniel's started to have some type of type of affection for him, and so knowing that this is that he's about to have to pronounce judgment, he's he's kind of disturbed in that way. Any any other thoughts? Why he might be appalled? I mean, if nothing else, Daniel, Daniel's a faithful man who's, who's been sharing God with Nebuchadnezzar, at the very least from time to time. May not have been all the time, but at the very least from time to time. And he's seen inklings over time of Nebuchadnezzar starting to put the pieces together, starting to, to learn more about God. But he just quite hasn't quite put it all together, right? He still... Is, is falling back to his old ways. He still has a belief in these other gods. He just can't quite uh, get over, over the hurdle, so to speak. So if you, have you ever dealt with that in your life? Somebody you've been working with, uh, trying to uh, share the gospel with, and, and time goes on, and, and you just can't get all the way to the finish line, so to speak? You ever dealt with that? It's frustrating. Right. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes it's someone that, you know, it's stubbornness, maybe somebody I don't like, but sometimes it's a, a very kind, you know, good as we may, as we may just describe them, good person, but there's just some, some obstacle that's, that if you could just get rid of that obstacle, you know, they would convert, but yes, sir. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's disturbing just even if you don't have any affection for him. It's just a, a disturbing image uh, that's about to happen to this person he knows. Uh, but, but Nebuchadnezzar clearly knows that what he's about to hear is not good because Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, I wish I could say this, would be saying this about your enemies, right? So we know it's not going to be good. It's not going to be something that Nebuchadnezzar wants to hear. 
All right, so here's another example in Daniel where the interpretation, I think, is relatively straightforward. It's clear. Uh, we don't have to really put our thinking caps on about what's going on. Uh, Daniel makes it very clear for us. So the tree is Nebuchadnezzar, of course. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar and his empire have become great. That's why he's content. That's why he's happy, uh, sitting fat and happy in his palace. Uh, he's, he's got a great empire. But it's all going to be taken from him. This great tree is going to be cut down. He's going to be driven away from mankind. He's going to become like an animal uh, until he recognizes God's rule over mankind. But what do we say about the stump? It's, there's going to be a stump. There's going to be roots that are left. It's not going to be the end. There's going to be a chance for growth. There's going to be a chance uh, for Nebuchadnezzar to come back to his senses um, all of this, this will happen until Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that God rules. And if we look uh, there in verse 27, what Daniel says, having relayed this interpretation of what's going to happen, he says, Therefore, O king, may, may my advice be pleasing to you. Wipe away your sin by doing righteousness and your wrongdoings by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. So there's a chance for Nebuchadnezzar to change before this happens. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar can repent, he can stop sinning, do what's right, and God may relent. All right? So so on some at the very least I think Daniel sees Nebuchadnezzar as a soul, right? As a soul, a, a person who God is pursuing, who wants who God wants to follow him, and Daniel encourages him to repent and do what's right. All right, so as we keep reading, though, in verse 28, we see that that's not what happens. All of this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And then verse 30 is where I think we really kind of see what the ultimate problem, or at least one of the main problems with Nebuchadnezzar is. The king began speaking and was saying, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you and you will be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place will be with the animals of the field. You'll be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the most high is ruler over the realm of mankind. All right, so we see the dream come to pass. How much time passes between the dream and its interpretation and its fulfillment? 12 months. Okay, so a, a relatively long time uh, for Nebuchadnezzar to change his ways. And maybe he did for a brief period, but as we read in verse 30, uh, that's not what ultimately happens. So Nebuchadnezzar is looking out. He's on his palace. So you can just imagine, uh, you know, he's there drinking his cup of coffee or tea or whatever. Kopi Luwak, isn't that, isn't that from uh, Iraq, that region? Um, whatever it is he's enjoying. But he's looking out at all that he has, and he sees that it's all him. It's all about me. I he believes that it's all what he built. I myself have built by the might of my power, my majesty. We see me, 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 me. All right? So pride uh, is what's going on here. It doesn't mean that he wasn't a, a good military tactician or, you know, he didn't have some management skills, things like that. Uh, but, but it's very, made very clear in this that God is who is, is responsible and who is ultimately in control in allowing Nebuchadnezzar to have the power and the success, success uh, that he has had. Um, so we'll come back to that, that idea of, of pride um, 
being behind the scenes here at the end as we make some application. But uh, so as, as he says all this, as he is uh, remarking about how great he is essentially, uh, this dream is fulfilled. Immediately, he's driven insane. He lives like an animal for a period of time. Um, some scholars have, have noted that there's different uh, psychological or medical or psychological uh, phenomena or conditions that, that would lead someone to living like an animal and thinking like an animal and things like that uh, for at least a time period. And, and that's fine if that's what, it, what God used to do this, but uh, this is clearly God uh, acting and doing this. And so whether it's through some documented medical episode or just through a miraculous intervention, uh, we clearly see God bringing this about. Um, we're, we're told that it's for seven periods of time. A lot of people assume this means seven years, and so you kind of that's what you'll read. People saying that this happened for seven years, which would have been a pretty long time to to live like this. I would say, um, I, I don't know. You know, it, it doesn't say years. Um, I, I don't know if it's if it's a specific period of time that's being talked about. We know in other places that the number seven is kind of used to, in, to indicate. Uh, perfection or completeness. So, so I think the point is that this is going to happen until God's purpose has been fulfilled, until God's purpose is completed, whether it's seven years or however long. Um, it doesn't matter if it is seven years or if it's not. The point is, is that this is going to happen until Nebuchadnezzar, the, the point has been made, that God is in control. It's not all about you, Nebuchadnezzar. So at the conclusion of this, Let's pick up in verse uh, 34. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. So we kind of see the ideas of that first proclamation at the beginning of the chapter repeated. But he does according to his will among the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can fend off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At that time, my reason restored to me, returned to me, and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the honor of my kingdom and my state counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So, I, so he's back in power, uh, back leading the empire. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and my and surpassing greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. So at the conclusion of the period, we see Nebuchadnezzar lifting his eyes toward heaven, looking, seeking out God, and blessing and praising him. So let's look, go back through those verses and look at what it is that, you know, we talked about what Nebuchadnezzar is learning about God, what he sees from God. Let's look at what, he, what he's recognizing at the end of this period, at the end of this punishment, what he recognizes. So verse 34, God's dominion is everlasting and his kingdom rules from generation to generation. Again, that's that message from chapter 2. Uh, his kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is, is not going to last even if it's restored to him now, it's eventually going to end. He's going to die, but God's dominion is everlasting. Verse 35, God does according to his will, both in heaven and on earth in the lives of men. He says no one can fend off his hand. No one uh, or everyone is accountable to him. No matter how powerful you are, how low you are, no one can fend off God. Everyone is accountable to him. Nobody can say, what have you done to God? Okay. Nebuchadnezzar now realizes it's not he that's resp ultimately responsible for all of his achievements. It's, it's God. He has what he has because of God. Verse 37, God's works are true. God's works are true, unlike the works of the false gods that he's believed in the rest of his life, right? So God's works are true. He's the one with true power. He's the one who is true to his word, who is able to bring about uh, what he says he's going to do. Verse 37, God's ways are just. So he's not coming out of this 
uh, thinking this was wrong. I shouldn't have had to deal with this. He says God's ways are just, so that's implying that what happened to him was right. What happened to him was justified. It was a just punishment. And then I think the key there is at the end. He humbles those who walk in pride. That's, that's definitely what we, we see here happening. When we're prideful, we're standing on what we think are our own accomplishments. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised when something comes to humble us. So we see Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is restored. God blesses him. This is really the end of, of the record that we have in the Bible uh, of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, we'll, we'll come back to some takeaway. We're almost out of time. Um, but I, to me, the, the, the recording, the, the events in Nebuchadnezzar's life that we read about are, are really interesting to me. If you think about the Bible, uh, the, the narrative of the Bible, the story elements of the Bible are really focused on, you know, if we want to categorize it, at the, the people of God, right? Uh, his followers, right? So in the beginning, we have the patriarchs, we have the nation of Israel. That's the focus of the Old Testament. When we come to the New Testament, it, the, the Gospels are focused on Jesus and his followers. The epistles are, are written by uh, the apostles, things like that. We, we have a focus on, on God's people when we read the narrative uh, story of the Bible. We, don't have, you know, we see elements from other people, but outside of you know, Pharaoh, there, there's not really another leader or person that I think we see as much insight into their spirituality, their spiritual journey as, as we do Nebuchadnezzar. We kind of see it at various points of Nebuchadnezzar's life, his, his growth or lack thereof. So it's just always interesting to me to think about um, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we, we see a lot, to me, I think we see some parallels in the life of Nebuchadnezzar in our lives. All right, he's, he's maybe has a very different life th than you and I. I mean, I don't think any of us are ever going to become a, an emperor, <laughs> um, maybe president, um, but very different lives. But what do we see Nebuchadnezzar doing? Ignoring sign after sign from God. We see pride. We see waiting until God breaks us down before we finally listen and, and seek God the way that we're supposed to. Um, so I think we can, we can, we kind of see, at least I see some of Nebuchadnezzar in my life. I don't know about you. Um, you think this was a true conversion? Chapter 4? There's a lot of debate about that. I don't, to me, I don't think there's enough to say one way or another. Um, but it's interesting to think about. You know, some people, you read that they say they think we'll see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Uh, some don't. Uh, but where we end off with the story of Nebuchadnezzar is him professing belief in God. Uh, does he become a, a monotheistic follower of God? I don't know. I don't, I don't think it's, it's clear. Uh, but I just think that the, the story of Nebuchadnezzar is very interesting to me. Um, we're out of time. We're going to come back uh, and talk about our kind of takeaways from this because I think they're very important. Um, yeah, the idea that God rules in our lives. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and then I think after we do that, we'll ha have enough time to cover all of chapter 5. Uh, we won't take as much time to do that as we have 